Cool. Hi, everyone. So I want to talk about the design of GeoMarkey and the sort of huge refactor that we're planning for it. Um, first, I want to say I had this nice talk built when Simon and I spoke yesterday, and now we solved most of the problems. So there will be a lot of complaining about problems which we know the solution to. But uh, it's, still, it's still somewhat interesting. So, so actually, GeoMarkey is a package that was created to create geographic visualizations. Now, what are these things called geographic visualizations? Well, there are, there are sort of a lot of things which fall into this category. Uh, one of the, the more common things that you might see are shaded polygons, which are these polygons of countries, states, districts, farms, whatever. And they're colored by some value. In this case, I've chosen random numbers. You might color it by GDP. You might color it by some metric about the, the area, whatever, right? Another type is rasterized spatial data. So rasterized spatial data is basically data on a grid. Uh, that grid can be in longitude latitude, as Tabia showed us. It can be not in longitude latitude. Um, but this grid over here shows the maximum temperature in the world historically in the month of, I believe this is July. Um, and so you can see Antarctica is really cold, you know, the equator is really hot, things like this. Uh, but this stuff comes a lot from satellite imagery, it comes a lot from weather monitoring. And one of the last components are these things called projections. Now, when we say projections, that term has a lot of meanings. You know, you might think, oh, okay, a projection in 3D space. No, these are specifically mathematical formulae which aim to project the ellipsoid that is the Earth um, onto a flat plane. And how they do that can sometimes be very different. So this is a projection that aims to maintain the area of uh, of each, basically the area to be equal. So you can see the US is slightly smaller than you see on like a latitude longitude map. Africa is quite large, actually looks quite large here. Uh, this, this fun little thing over here is the interrupted good homolysign, which is again, it's this very, very, very nonlinear projection, which is aimed at basically showing again, land in its natural, in, in, in its most accurate state. Down here, we have Mercator, the Mercator projection. That was a standard of, you know, seafarers and things like this. And it's, so this is basically, imagine you have a cylinder that wraps around the earth and you project the earth onto that cylinder and then unroll the cylinder. So th that is the Mercator projection and it actually preserves your heading. So whichever direction you're pointing, if you move to another point and point in that same direction, you're still pointing in the same direction on the map. The last one over here is a conic projection. And that's basically, imagine you have a cone over the earth, you project the earth onto the cone, and then you unravel that cone onto paper, um, which has its own nice properties. You can see sort of, you can see that at the pole, uh, it's actually not, uh, it's not a single point. It's, it's sort of a coordinate singularity there. Uh, so that's an interesting thing we have to keep aware of. And some of the use cases of polygons are this, this thing called a choropleth where you share polygons by some value. You can represent areas on the globe. It's really efficient to project them in these projections because really you're only projecting a bunch of lines, right? Uh, which is not so, so difficult. Um, and here you can actually see, this is an, a fun little map we made with a survey taken from citizens of India, people who live in these, these areas about what they thought the next five years would look like. Did they think it was good, which is blue? Did they think, uh, which is actually green, sorry. Did they, were they not sure, which is this blue thing? And were they, did they think it would be bad, which is red? Um, raster use cases. So rasters are values on grids. The grids are usually regularly sampled. Sometimes they can be rectilinear. Uh, sometimes they can be just unstructured meshes, which we can do too. Very accessible through rasters or jail. So thank you. Um, I don't actually see that here. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. Um, you know, satellite imagery, things like this. But when you think of a raster, it's just values on a grid. So you can make contours, you can make surfaces. Uh, you don't have to restrict yourself to this heat map representation. So let's talk a little bit about transforms. Now, the simplest case is this assigned transformation, which is some combination of moving something, scaling something, so stretching it out in some dimension and rotating it, right? Uh, really easy to figure out, easily applicable in Naki. For all the mathematicians out here, there's a group of matrices called SO3, which is basically a bunch of four by four matrices that encode all possible defined transformations in the real space uh, in R3. And the important thing here is that a straight line is always a straight line, right? Um, 
And this is not necessarily the case in other transformations. So let's, let's move to another kind of transformation, which is this nonlinear transformation, but it's separable. So, so you know, the x-axis is, is transformed by log 10, the y-axis is transformed by the natural log, but you'll see that the x-coordinate after the transform only depends on the x-coordinate before the transform. It doesn't depend on the y-coordinate. Similarly, the y-coordinate after the transform only depends on the y-coordinate before the transform. So in that sense, that I can sort of separate these things. The, 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 I won't say linear, linearly separable, but they're separable in the sense of an ODE being separable. Um, ah, I don't actually have the picture for this here. But this is the picture I was going to show. <laughs> um, this is that interrupted good model sign again. And this is a nonlinear transformation. As you can see, it's highly nonlinear. X, this is a line which is actually constant in X, but you can see that the final X position also depends on the Y position, right? Um, and this causes, this is, you know, this is a little complicated to do. Um, so you have to think a lot more about it. Some of these are technically 3D, but really when you think of them, you think of them in two dimensions as black boxes, right? I, I have a black box, it has a forward mode, it has an inverse mode, so I can, I can go between these two spaces. Um, and so the question is how we manage that. Um, one thing I do wanna to touch upon is how you use these transformations in Maki. So as we spoke about earlier in the, in the con, Maki has this thing called a scene graph. So if I look at this, this pretty simple stream plot, which has this axis object, which is this bunch of lines, uh, it has the stream plot, which is the colored lines and the scatters, and this is the scene graph. So we have the root scene, we have the block scene of that layouted scene, we have the layouted scene itself, and then two plots which within that, which are this axis 3D and the stream plot. Now, at any point in the scene graph, I can inject what's called, all of these objects in the scene graph have this thing called a transformation, which encodes four things. It encodes translation, scale, rotation, which go into this model matrix SO3, uh, but it, it can also encode a nonlinear transform function. And that function basically takes in these point types, which Maki depends on from geometry basics, and it, it would return a point type. Uh, but what it does inside can be basically anything, right? Um, and I can inject that here, but I can also inject it here at the top level. Um, and so you can, you can theoretically have different plots with different transforms, that's totally acceptable. Uh, so for something like what Fabio was showing earlier, where you have these uh, these grids which need to be transformed in one way from, from some other coordinate space to lat long, and then you have lat long data, you can just give the grids the trans their transformation and then give your other data no transformation and let it just be latitude and longitude. So a brief history of Geomarchy. It started out as a library to visualize polygons from shape files, which is this format which stores polygons in 2020-ish. Um, very, very soon we added projection support. We added this plot recipe geo axis. So at that time, axes were just plot objects in the scene. So really the scene would have this nonlinear transformation um, and all the plot objects would inherit that. Um, and so this, this had, the, the plot object had almost no special treatment. It was really easy to create. Currently in the latest released version, geo axis is a, is a very hacky hijack of the Maki axis object. So it lets the axis object handle the layouting, but it hijacks the, you know, the grids and the frame and all of that um, to make them non, um, representative of a nonlinear space. In the near future, we're, we're working on a block implementation for GeoAxis, which is a lot more controllable. Um, so for example, this, this thin wrapper thing, it couldn't really handle the coordinate singularity. So if you wanted to show the pole and the pole wasn't at the center of the plot, you couldn't really do that, it didn't make sense. Um, now you can. And in the far future, my, my thought with this whole thing was to create a generic nonlinear axis, which, which would support really any transform. Um, Lester, how much time do I have left? How much time do I have left? All right, cool. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so, so this generic nonlinear axis could support, you know, there's a lot of coordinate spaces in mathematics or physics. Uh, for example, and maybe I can go a little far over here. Yeah. So, so this is actually the interior of a black hole, uh, the space near a black hole. And so this region two is, is sort of within the event horizon. This is outside the event horizon. 
three and four uh, theoretical spaces, white holes, things like this, they're inaccessible. But you can see that this over here is actually the trajectory of an object falling into the black hole. And you can see where it crosses the event horizon. Um, and in this case, these radially outward lines are time. And the, the sort of curving lines, uh, which, which go vertically, are distance to the center of the black hole in radius. Um, and now, ideally, I made this in Maki by hand, but ideally, we would have an axis which just supports this. I just encode this transform, put it in there, and it just supports it, which would be very cool. And there, there are a lot of other similar, you know, coordinate spaces which this could be useful for. So that was the final ambition, so to say. Um, yeah, so like I said, so going back to what GeoAxis is now and how we can improve it, GeoAxis currently hijacks the axis' spines, it sticks, et cetera, but it lets it handle the layout. It actually returns an axis object. <laughs> so that's the level of hacking we're talking about. Um, the pros are that the bound bounding boxes are tied in what we call input space. So input space being generally latitude and longitude. Um, we don't really need to do that much maintenance. Julius handles everything <laughs> on the axis side. But the cons are that we can't handle cases where the latitude longitude bounding box is not a box. So by not a box, specifically, I mean, um, I were to look at this picture, right? Now you can see over here, right? This is not a line in latitude longitude space. This is not a straight line in latitude longitude space. That's actually a curve, right? Um, and if I were to represent that as a bounding box, it would either be really huge or really tiny. And the solution to this was actually to represent all of the limits in the camera and things like this after the transform. And so now I'll just talk about some of the challenges inherent to, to the geoaxis, which, which a lot of these we've, we've thought of solutions for now. Um, so on normal axes, you offset the tick labels based on dimensions. So the tick labels are, you know, the, the, the labels for the X values and the Y values. And generally on, on the Y axis, you shift them to the left in X. On the X axis, you shift them down in Y. But well, when you have a linear projection, if you shift something left, you might actually go inside the projection. You might, you know, if the projection is a curve, you might not get the entire tick out. And so you need to think about that and you need to think about how you can push it out. But also on geographic projections, you can't really project points beyond plus minus 90 degrees latitude. A lot of them just error out. It doesn't make sense. So what do we do then? Um, so I'll give you an example, right? Right now, this is with, with no spacing. And you can see, you know, sort of, sort of over here, if I were to push this this way, and I were to push this zero this way by the same amount, zero would go quite far out of the axis, but 40, maybe the zero of the 40 would still flip, right? Uh, similarly for that AD up there, so on and so forth. And down here, this is fairly simple. The, the x-axis is fairly simple because of the nature of the projection, but it's not always this way. Now, the solution we'd implemented so far, uh, and you can see it's still not, not totally good, was to sort of try and calculate the normal vector. Uh, so basically calculate the direction that this goes in outside the axis. Um, and as you can see, that technique wasn't really so great. Um, the new idea is actually to, we have this line, right? And so what we can do is we can iterate along this line whenever we find the tick position, we can calculate uh, the direction of the perpendicular bisector to the line. So basically we calculate this directly, the, uh, this direction, and then we just push the tick out in that direction. Um, and th we haven't implemented this yet. Simon just came up with this yesterday. So, so we're going to do that. Um, the next question is, how do I find this border? Sometimes it's really simple, right? Sometimes it's just uh, this point to this point to this point to this point, and we just transform the, the, the intermediate lines. Um, that's not necessarily always the case. So let's take this projection as an example, right? That red thing you see there is the border, but we couldn't have calculated that from a box in latitude longitude space. Um, because, and, and similarly for this, you actually have multiple borders uh, that sort of go along here and it's not easy. So what you do 
is you grid the bounding box in this transformed space, so the space after you apply the transformation at a highish resolution, you project all the values on this grid, you apply the inverse projection back into input space, and you check whether the result of that inverse transformation is valid, as in a valid latitude longitude pair or not. Um, and so then you can take the contour of these valid versus invalid values, and that gets you a, a border, so to speak. Um, I wonder where this is in. Okay, yeah. So, so for this projection, right, this is the result of that, that algorithm. So, well, I call it an algorithm, really, it's brute force. But you sort of see that this purple area here is invalid, and the yellow area here are actually valid lat long coordinates. And similarly, for this orthographic projection, you see that it's really just this, this circle in the middle of the of the screen, which makes sense because it's an orthographic projection of the sphere, but um, obviously that's not the case in latitude longitude space. Um, another thing that we want to do is find where these thick lines, these grid lines intersect this, this spine and then put the thick tables there because, so in the refactor, we don't even have this, <laughs> um, but at an earlier stage where we tried a different method, um, we were able to actually have these thick tables but of course they're inside the globe, which doesn't really make sense. And just to give you an idea of exactly how slow this method was, I'm gonna show you a GIF of me trying to zoom in. And you can see that every time I try to zoom in, it takes about a hundred milliseconds to move to the next zoom level, which is actually quite slow. <laughs> so we do, we do need to speed that up, um, but there are ways to do that. Yeah, as I said, it's not always, well, it's not always as simple as finding valid and invalid values because some projections don't define external regions. So for some projections, um, like that equal earth thing I showed, you have this, this within negative 90 and 90 uh, degrees of latitude and negative 180, 180 degrees of longitude, everything is fine. When you leave that area, it basically just rolls over again. <laughs> and what that means is that you have to figure out the spine from what you know about the space, which is that the maximum possible bounding box is this negative 90 to 90, negative 180 to 180. And to give you an example of how we might do that, this is a conic projection, which I've zoomed into. This box you see on the outside is actually the bounding box in transformed space. So that's the limit of the scene. Um, and you can see that the, the white areas here are, are technically invalid. So that's outside the earth. Now the, the idea here is you start from the spot from the line, you start from the box in latitude longitude space, negative 90, negative 90 to 90, negative 180 to 180. You transform that into transformed space, and then you sort of iterate along it and find where it intersects this transformed space boundary. So I don't know if this really makes sense, but basically what I do is I keep going along this line. When this line hits the transformed space boundary. I know that, okay, earlier the transformed space line was within that line, now it's outside that line, so I need to switch to this curved line. Keep going along the curve, oh, it intersects here. So now I know internally that I need, my boundary is now this transformed space line, but I keep iterating along this curve, go down, oh, here it intersects again, so we go back, we use the curve again, right? And it intersects here, so we go back to the transformed space line, which is the bounding box line, which is this, keep going. Again, it intersects here, so we switch, intersects here, so we switch, so on and so forth. So I don't know if that really made sense, but it, it might give you sort of a picture of what exactly of, the, of what exactly has to be done. And it's not quite simple, but at least we know what to do now. Um, yeah, the final ambition was for this, as I said, was to lay the foundations for a gen generic nonlinear axis. It should support any transformation. It should be able to handle coordinate singularities and all of this fun stuff. Um, you'd also want ideally a simple and easy interface to provide information about the transformation. So for all geographic transformations, the bounding box in the input space would be negative 180 to 180, negative 90 to 90. But for a black hole space, that may not necessarily be the case. You may have some other bounding box. Um, you may have some other domain rather, uh, default limits, things like this. Uses in physics, any nonlinear separable transformation. And I showed this already, but just to go over it again in a little more detail if you guys are interested, these are what's called Kruskal-Shakers coordinates. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but um, 
they're a way to represent time and space around a black hole. So as you know, when you're near a black hole, uh, there's actually this thing called time dilation. And so the length of time that you perceive is not the length of time that some observer a very far distance away perceives. Um, and so actually your local time is, is quite slow. And what happens when you get to this R equals one, which is the event horizon of the black hole, is that your time becomes so slow, your, 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 the time in your frame of reference becomes so slow with respect to an external observer's time, that to the external observer, it looks like you've frozen, right? Because your time is moving so slowly. Um, and these sort of radial lines are, are representative of time, uh, what they call proper time and relativity. And the verticalish lines are representative of distance. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the sort of idea. And, you know, maybe we can spruce this axis up a little bit at some point. Um, so the actual design of the geoaxis, geoaxis in the refactor is defined as a block, uh, which is basically this like atomic layout primitive, so to speak, um, which can be composed. And it contains a scene which doesn't have a transformation. So that scene only cares about what your data is after the transformation, right? And so this enables us to represent coordinate singularities and all that stuff. Um, the way we apply the transformation to any plot that gets plotted into this geoaxis is we overload the plot bang function. And so anytime you plot bang into a geoaxis, it will set the transform of the plot, the transform func of the plot to be this, this transformation from longitude and latitude to whatever projection you want. Um, we determine the border of the legal area by this brute force technique in the spine and whatnot. And we already spoke about the tick labels. So I'll skip over that. Um, just a couple of cool examples, if you guys want, I don't know. Um, so I wanted to show just how easy it is to visualize data. <laughs> Um, and so this actually doesn't use GeoMarkey, this uses rasters.jl and the new Marky recipes we've integrated there. Um, rasters.jl has a feature where you can download certain common sets of rasters. Uh, in this case, we're downloading the world time set, we're downloading the climate variables from within that. We specify that we only want the precipitation layer, layer for the months one through 12, right? Um, and so this will automatically download it, store it. You have to set an environment variable on where to store it. Um, this is really cool. So this worked with uh, basically no, no other uh, integration. Data interpolations or JL doesn't know anything about rasters, but because they're both rasters are abstract arrays, I can use data interpolations or JL to create a cubic spline, which fits basically um, to the raster and allows me to interpolate at any time. So, so this is the data and this is your time vector basically. Um, now I've created a heat map here, right? Um, this heat map is created with the first element of this raster series, which is basically a vector of rasters. Um, some stuff about the axis. This is a nice function. Um, so basically what this Z-scale algorithm is commonly used by astronomers, uh, because in astronomy, you'll have these huge outlier values, um, which is basically, you know, maybe a pixel burned out on your sensor, or maybe there's some other issue. So what they do, to, in order to retain visual contrast, is they actually sample a bunch of pixels throughout uh, your data, and then they will get a, you basically derive a color range from that. And so that's what we've done here, plotting a color bar and just recording this animation. And this is not that much code, for which this is the result. So you can see that we're progressing through the years. It's nice and smooth, the interpolation is, you know, with the interpolation, your video becomes very smooth as opposed to this like sort of staccato thing. Um, and you can see how the, the precipitation, the areas of maximum precipitation sort of shift as the seasons change. Um, <laughs> this was an especially interesting one. So I wanted to show the power of Marky recipes here. We've defined the conversion from a raster to something that's plotable by Marky such that for any, so, so there's this concept called a conversion trait. Right, and that's basically for any plot type, I can say that this plot type accepts arguments in this way. Uh, so, so for example, the point-based conversion trait will accept 
x comma y, x comma y comma z, a vector of points, things like this. Uh, in this case, both surface and heat map are what we call continuous surface like. And so they accept basically a grid defined by x and y, uh, vectors of x and y, and then a matrix of z values. Um, so because we've defined the conversion for any continuous surface like type, I can just change heat map to surface and get this. Um, and this was, I think, also animated. Well, kind of cool, you know. Uh, up here, the numbers represent month. And I think this is this data is basically temperature. And so you can see the surface dip through the heat map. This was rendered in GLMRP. And I mean, it's not the great data visualization, but it's sort of representative of the kind of stuff we can do with this. Um, this was a visualization. Again, it's not a great visualization, but shows off kind of what you can do. Uh, this is a visualization of the temperature, which is sort of uh, the temperature is coloring a mesh here. Uh, the mesh is the sphere. And these little bars, which are actually uh, rainfall. And if I play it again, you'll see that as the seasons change, the positions of the bars also change. And this is a slightly short animation, but again, we've done all the interpretation all of that. Uh, the code for this is actually up on a PR to beautiful Marky. Um, this is a beautiful Marky example. Thank you, Lazaro. Um, and this actually uses GeoMarky as it was before this refactor. So this is a stereographic projection at the North Pole. And this is the only case where you can actually show the North Pole. If the North Pole was slight, if you wanted to show like a slightly offset view, you wouldn't be able to do that. So if you wanted the North Pole, for example, to be here and you show other stuff in the other areas, you can do that. Um, this is, I think, earthquake data. So it shows the severity of earthquakes. You can see the Pacific Ring of Fire and things like this. That's pretty neat. Ah, this was fun. This was a poster. So I, I had done some consulting for, for an economic think tank and they wanted a solution to quickly create posters with Marky. And by poster, I don't mean like scientific posters. I mean, posters that you can wrap and put up in your wall and things like this. And what we did was we were actually able to create a function which describes a layout and creates like this logo and title and this little description thing and things like this um, automatically. And then you can plot into that layout whatever you want. So in this case, we plotted a raster of precipitation in India. We plotted some fake data on the states. There's two different kinds of legend, a little QR code, which you can actually scan and take to the website. A little description down here. And you can see there's a lot of padding so that you can actually frame this thing. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So yeah, any questions? Comments, questions? So first, thanks for the great packet. And also, um, how difficult would it be to extend this to general manifold? Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I will say that I haven't really touched manifolds. Um, I'm not a PhD student. I just got my bachelor's last year. <laughs> um, but if you're saying, so, so what, what Geomarchy does, there are some specializations towards geographic plotting, like that, uh, you know, negative 180 to 180 boundary and things like this. But the general approach is definitely very changeable. And even right now, without any of this geomarchy stuff, if you define the transformation correctly, you can do all of this nonlinear stuff. You can go from 2D to 3D, 3D to 2D, and encode that into a transformation in Marky. Um, and so there's this type called point trans, which allows you to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, as long as you can define that, that transformation, it should be fine. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Give me a second. Yeah. Some cardio. I thought you exercised us yesterday. Yeah. I did more. Yeah. This one. Uh, one comment I had was that uh, the stick pushing thing. You can also look at the source of axis three because I do something similar there. Like. Pushing the ticks away from the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. from the axis depending on screen space orientation. 
Interesting. Um, so that might help you implementing that. And the other thing was, so do you think we should uh, change the implementation of transformations so that it's not point by point, but basically, like for example, if, if some data set crosses, uh, like a line crosses the, the edge of the plot and then goes to the other end, mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine that some transformation would just create more points, right? Like you have, let's say you have just one line that goes from one point across the border to the other side, to another point. And then your transformation could split that up into two lines separated by a NAND value. So it doesn't. Right? Absolutely. So that's, that's something I have wanted to do, but basically what what I think it might require, so this is what I just pulled up as an example of exactly what you're saying, right? The lines wrap around the entire axis because they're not split up at, at that point. And I think one of the things we could do is, is allow the back, is basically in the back end, what we're doing is we just call apply transform point by point, right? Uh, we just apply this transform to each individual point, no matter whether it's a, a grid or a, a vector of points or, you know, a mesh or whatever. Um, what I think we could do is we could have dispatches on plot type. So when you, when you say apply transform on lines and you give it a vector of lines, it'll automatically know, okay, I can densify, I can split up, I can do all of this stuff. Uh, because one other thing that I think Matplotlib does is if I just define a line with two points, one here and one here, it will automatically kind of, kind of create this curve. And right now we can't do that with Marky. So I think that's definitely something that I would love to do. Um, the other thing that it would also help with is like um, some polygons, if they are at absolutely at the North Pole, they'll somehow click down to the, like one triangle in the mesh will go down to the equator. So if you can smartly rasterize that or meshify that, that would also be good. Yeah, sounds good. I just want to add that. Uh, you want also to add something? Yeah. <laughs> just, just a second. I just want to add that. Uh, I feel like that is often a complication with this um, pipeline approach where you think in terms of steps, one step mm -hmm. following next, and they're kind of independent. But as it turns out in plotting, at least in my experience, it's kind of all, like you have to consider all parts at once yes. to come to the best solution. And for example, like in this case, like you can't separate transformation from plot, uh, plot type because the output that you want must exactly. be geared towards that. And also, you probably don't want to separate it even from something like the lip, the, um, the zoom. Because why would you want to align your block to fix it? Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's a great idea to also figure out the, the bounding box and transform the thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think one thing. Yeah, so Simon, you're gonna say something? Yeah, 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 we were talking about that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's that, and there's also, you know, the other issue that I've found is that because I treat these projections as a black box, right, I don't really have a way to extract these little parameters. And so this, this non-zero equals 160, negative 160, basically what this is doing is you can think of it as sort of circularly shifting the projection. Um, so it, it, it makes it such that the center is now longitude negative 160. Um, and of course, these lines are not built for that, and we, we don't necessarily have a way right now to tell, oh, okay, this, this projection has is shifting, so cut the lines at, you know, negative 160 plus 90 and negative 160, sorry, negative 160 plus 180, negative 160 minus 180, as opposed to just minus 180, 180. So that's, I think, also something we will have to think about going forward. Uh, Michael, you had a question. Oh, yeah, no problem. With holes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that. So, so that's how GeoMonkey started, right? It was this need to plot multi polygons and polygons and things like this. So I think right now it does allow for that. Um, it does allow for that, but you need to be careful which which projection your polygons are in. Usually they're in latitude longitude space, sometimes they're not. And so it, if you accidentally say, oh, I know these are in that long space, but in actuality, the values are like 3000, you're gonna have problems. Thank you.